All right, thank you guys for staying. This is the last presentation, so I'll try to get through it quickly. Um, so I studied the Konitzplatz in Munich as the first Nazi forum. And I'll get into more details as we go. But I'm going to start with where I started. So I've always really loved German culture and German language. And while I was traveling through Germany, I kept being, uh, or my interest kept being sparked by these remnants of the Nazi past and how the city deals with them, and obviously their class to classicism. And so that's something that I knew I wanted to research more in depth. And so I started talking to professors and kind of narrowing in on an idea, which ultimately led me to conduct a comparative study between the Koenigsplatz and the form of Trajan, because I wanted to reveal the Koenigsplatz's connections to the form typology and understand how that typology was adapted under Nazi building policy. So form of Trajan and uh, rendering of the Koenig's plots that I pulled from a travel guide from the 1930s. Um, so some quick background information. The Koenig's plots is a Renaissance square that originally was in the suburbs of Munich. It, the, it kind of has three phases the way I see it. The first phase was the initial Renaissance square that started in the early 1800s with the Propylaea, the Glyptotech, and the Staats Gallery. So these were all art museums besides the Propylaea, which is just the formal gate into the city. Um, and then in 1928, Braunus House, which is this building here, the family that owned it as a little villa what had Nazi sympathies. And Munich was the city which the Nazi party gained their most traction and was later called the Hauptstadt der Bewegung. And so that means the capital of the movement. So even though when they were in power, Berlin was still the capital, they identified the capital of their movement as being Munich. Um, so the owners of the Braunus House gave their house to the Nazi party to use as an administrative building. And from there, the Nazi party wanted to take the square and transform it into their administrative um, capital. Um, and so they added two buildings and two temples. As you can see here, this one is the Führerbau, so where Hitler had his office. And this is one of the Ehren Temple, the Temple of Honor. And they are reflected across the central axis. So because the site had a very strong evolution, a lot of what I had to do was archive research. So I got a membership with the state library in Bavaria and was able to go there and get copies and look at documents from the time. So that's the main staircase of the library. Here is a guide that describes Munich um, as the Fuhrer saw it. And then this is a traffic plan to see like how they altered the traffic around the Koenig's plots. Here are two examples of the maps, one of which is that traffic plan. Methodology also included on-site work and sketches. A lot of what I was looking at was the character of the site and how this classically urban plan translated into the architecture itself. Um, so obviously, the site was used as a forum. So there's a lot of functional comparisons we can draw. Both of these sites were used to immortalize their creator and really demonstrate their conquering attitude. So they both have military veneration with the Column of Trajan and then also this uh, obelisk, which is part of the was which is part of an extension of the Koenig's plots um, that is attributed to the fallen Bavarian army of uh, against Napoleon. So they're calling back to what they viewed as German military, specifically Bavarian. Um, these spaces were also main places for gathering. And so they both held governmental buildings and arguably temples. And they both wanted to have a strong sense of culture with libraries and arts and community. So taking one little case study, there's the Basilica Opia in the form of Trajan and the Führerbau. And so both of these are very low, dominant spanning horizontal buildings. So they have strong horizontality with relentless repetition vertically. Um, so here are quick sketches I did. And it was also interesting how on the ground level, the um, 
entry porches and porticos almost appeared pasted on to these structures. I'm gonna show a quick size comparison. The Nazis were known for making everything bigger and exploding the scale, removing that human proportionality. So you can see that the Forum of Trajan, which was one of the largest Roman forum and one of the later more developed ones, is pretty small compared to the Königsplatz itself. Also looking at form and distribution, so both of these places have an entry gate that lets out into the main public gathering space with some sort of axiality in the two anchoring side pieces. Then comes the um, dominant transverse of the administrative buildings, the basilica or the Führerbau and the temples, ending with a vertical um, terminus. But this gets contradictory because that's not how the Nazis used it. They actually had the reverse procession through, so they didn't enter through the gate. They went out from the city and left. So that kind of left me thinking, what were the actual comparisons? And why wasn't there more of an intervention? Basically, the Paul Ludwig Trost, the architect of the Koenigs, the Nazi architect of the Koenigsplatz, did do things to formalize the space. He paved it, he added the lampposts for some added axiality, he did the temples in the Führerbau. Um, but it, it just seems like they're so dominant in every aspect of their policy. Why wasn't there a more drastic intervention? I mean, this square really still lacks containment. It's still clearly suburban and has that kind of unkept feel to it. Um, so why with all this power did they not? I didn't mention it was the first one. And so I argue that this was kind of a testing ground for what came later with, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> um, talking about the containment. This was a problem that the uh, Renaissance architect had from the very beginning. He recognized that he wanted it to be more contained, but the city planners would not let him contain this and add more buildings to it. They wanted it to be green. Um, and so it's especially strange knowing that there had been historically other proposals that would arguably be more forum-like, that contained the space more, that had more dominant urban classicism um, and so why they didn't choose to take a more dramatic path was interesting. And I think they realized that that was kind of unkept potential because you can see later with the work of Albert Speer and later Nazi building policy that they completely disregarded that. They were willing to destroy large portions of existing cities to create a more... Um, harmonious view of what they wanted with their architecture. So this is Albert Speer's plan for Germania, so basically destroying the center of Berlin to create this large north-south axis. So thank you. Questions for Steph. Yes. Do you have any theory on why it is that they didn't go through the gate and then towards the tower? So the parade, when these were, so there were two types of events that were really held. There were the rallies, which is what you see on the left, and there was the parade and the procession, which was on the right. The procession was always tied to um, the Nazi party and its art. So there's another famous building in Munich which is the House of Art. So I don't know if anyone's aware, but the Nazi party had a degenerative art exhibit where they took art of Jewish artists and other people and modern artists that they hated and were like, look, this is trash. Um, and they built this building basically for that purpose. And so when they started the design scheme, when the building was opened, and then every year on the anniversary of the building's inauguration, they had a parade from the Haus der Kunst, this museum, to the Kronigsplatz, and they ended in the Kronigsplatz. But the Haus der Kunst is in the middle of the city, so they had to leave the city to get there. Um, and so that's why they had to end up, they had to actually reverse 
the natural progression of this space. Thank you. Oh, wait, one more. Sorry. Um, I guess, like, the only other major Nazi urban space that I'm familiar with that was actually, like, built was the parade grounds in Nuremberg. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you, you studied any sort of correlation between the two, or? Yeah, um, that's something that I've wanted to look into more. That the Nuremberg rally grounds were also planned by Speer, and uh, that's an interesting case too because it is also very suburban. Where like this was suburban, but then the city grew around it. In Nuremberg, it's still very much on the outskirts of the city, um, and so it has a definite different feel to it, and it doesn't have that formal classicism, urbanistic classicism quite like a forum. Andrew? It's interesting to bring up Nuremberg because if I remember correctly, Speer with the, um, the theater in Nuremberg was an attempt to try to surpass the Coliseum. Like with the design of its capacity, it was just like double the capacity of the Coliseum. So it didn't have the urban component, so it's architecturally definitely the last thing. Yeah, so there are a lot of classical ties, like specifically on each element at the Nuremberg Rally Grounds. So they had a processional way. They had the Congress Hall, which I think is what you're referring to, but they the Congress Hall and the stadium, and they had a march field, and then they had a field for the military drills. Um, and so these this takes up a lot of space. It's a very large complex. It's not something that can be contained necessarily in an urban square. So the main spine of that um, particular scheme is their processional route. And then all the other pieces kind of branch off of that. Um, and not that I'm, I'm not aware of any like one precedent for that whole site, but there are definitely specific ones that correlate to the individual aspects and different, like the Congress Hall is the Coliseum um, and the, um, Zeppelin Field is based off the um, Pergamon altar. Thank you.